Hello, everyone, um, and welcome to today's CID speaker series event, first one of the semester. I am Maryam Garab, a first year student at Harvard College studying government and economics. Um, and I'm a student ambassador for the Center of International Development at Harvard University. I'm looking forward to moderating today's discussion on digital government, the foundations for global development and democracy. And just to give you guys a brief overview um, of the format of today's event, uh, the today's session will be about a 20 to 25 minute presentation, uh, followed by roughly 20 minutes for Q&A. And before we get started, I wanna just mention a few housekeeping items. Uh, during the Q&A, you can submit questions directly in the chat um, or by using the raise hand function. And we'll also be recording today's session and the video of this event will be available on the CID YouTube channel. And just to let you guys know, our speaker series event uh, for next Friday on February 11th will be at our normal time of 12 p.m. And we will have Jacqueline Klopp, the co-director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development and a research scholar at Columbia University who will discuss climate change, digital data commons, and the politics of urban transport in African cities. We hope you guys will join us. And also save the date for the March 2nd um, for a virtual panel event with Harvard experts on how to apply lessons learned and reimagine the future of work. But without further ado, I'd like to briefly introduce our speakers for today, Megan Dooley and George Ingram. Megan is a global program officer at the development implementing firm Tetra Tech, where she supports research, learning, and monitoring and evaluation efforts on a $25 million US aid land tenure and natural resource management project um, implemented across eight countries. Prior to tech, Tetra Tech, Megan was a senior research analyst in the Center for Sustainable Development at the Brookings Institution, where she supported quantitative research on women's economic empowerment, migrant and refugee labor force integration, global poverty trends, sovereign debt, and digital transformation. She has an MS in global human development from Georgetown University and has lived and worked in the Middle East for a number of years, including in Turkey, Jordan, and the West Bank. George Ingram's professional career in Congress, the executive branch, and the nonprofit sector has focused on the international economic and development policy, he is a senior fellow in the Center for Sustainable Development, housed in the Global Economy and Development Program at Brookings. He also serves as Chair Emeritus of the U.S. Global Leadership Coalition and member of the Executive Committee of the Modernizing Foreign Assistance Network. From 1973 to 1995, Mr. Ingram was a senior staff member of the House Committee on Foreign Affairs, responsible for international economic and development issues. From 1998 to 2000, he was Principal Deputy Assistant Administrator of the Agency for International Development with primary responsibility for US assistance programs in the former Soviet Union. From 2001 to 2011, he worked at AED, first as founding director of the Basic Education Coalition, subsequently as founding director of the Education Policy and Data Center, and then a senior vice president for the public policy. And briefly as interim president and CEO. Mr. Ingram holds a bachelor's degree from the University of North Carolina, a master's degree from John Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Thank you all for being here. And Megan and George, over to you. Uh, as a fellow Tar Heel, Miriam, thank you for that introduction. Um, Clara, thank you for inviting Megan and I to make a presentation on our report on digital government. Our format today is I will set the scene of digital government. Megan will present the data on the state of digital government in developing countries. And then I will wrap it up with a few of our findings and recommendations. The reason for the study was that with governments increasingly becoming dependent on digital capabilities, a trend is dramatically propelled by COVID-19. It seemed that foreign assistance donors, the whole community, policymakers, development experts, implementers, 
needed better information and guidance on how to approach digital government. The focus of the study is on what is digital government, what are its key components, what are the benefits, challenges, and risks, what is the state of digital government in developing countries, and how can donors improve their programs to advance digital government. As a practical framework for thinking about the key aspects of digital government, we identify six components. Although digital government does not progress along a linear path, there is some degree of order and sequencing in how we list the six components. There's a degree of increasing sophistication and complexity. Although, for example, while security is listed last, there needs to be an element of security from day one, but it becomes more compelling and sophisticated as the digital capabilities and reach of government expand. So to start on the list, digital infrastructure is that panoply of hard and software that comprise the complexity of ICT networks that serves both government, the economy, and society at large. Digital liter literacy involves integrating digital skills in traditional education programs, but also ongoing worker training, reskilling, and lifelong learning. With respect to digital data, communications, and services, digital government tends to start with the building of databases by individual government agencies and programs, followed by using government websites to communicate information to the populace, followed by providing services online, increasingly in an interactive mode. Digital participation is a step further along the process of making digital government more sophisticated. It ranges from government soliciting the views of the public on specific issues, to citizens voting on budget priorities, to at the most advanced stage, 44% of voters in Estonia in the 2011 election casting their ballots from their home computers. Digital institutions, policies, and regulations involves where relevant one for government activities to actually move online and alternatively, secondly, making existing analog functions and regulations compatible with the digital world, recognizing that services that require considerable human judgment cannot be brought fully online. Finally, with respect to digital security and rights, governments are only recently coming to grips with the need to ensure that digital government protects the rights and privacy of citizens and is itself protected from cyber attacks and abuse. There are various conditions for effective digital government. One is political leadership. Strong, ongoing leadership that bridges political administrations is essential to take a country down the path of long-term building of digital capability. Secondly, it involves the willingness and ability to take risk. And that requires that strong leadership willing to take risk. Trust is essential to convince the pub populace to use digital government and even to get government workers to deploy and use it. Transparency builds trust and accountability. And digital government services must be frictionless, seamless, rights respecting and anticipatory. In other words, it must be user friendly. The benefits of digital government are pretty obvious. One is efficiency. A second is responsiveness. A third is greater transparency. And that transparency is key to building trust and accountability 
and in many instances to making government less corrupt. A USA TAPAS program on e-procurement in the Ukraine has helped the government save $7 billion over seven years. Some of that coming from greater efficiency, some of it from getting around that middle, middle level management uh, where corruption often occurs. And finally, digital government can help traverse the last mile to reach traditionally underserved populations. Finally, on challenges and risks, digital government can cause harm if it used maliciously by governments with autocratic tendencies and inclinations, it can be used to control and abuse citizens of a country. It can result and does result in digital divides at a ge geographic level between urban areas and rural areas, demographically between men and women, between better served and underserved populations and the real subject of this paper between countries. There's a tension between the need for a centralized platform, but also the need to decentralize databases and execution to those services and programs that are closer to the customers and citizens they serve. Uh, Digital government is not a panacea. It's not gonna resolve the basic malfunctions of government. And finally, uh, failure. It is calculated that 30% of IT projects in developing countries are total failures. 50 to 60% are partial failures. So less than 20% achieve intended objectives. So that's where we come back to that willingness to take risk and the willingness and ability to learn along the process to minimize the failures that almost by certain are gonna occur during the process. Uh, Megan, over to you. Thanks, George. So for donor organizations to maximize their contribution to trying to bridge this digital divide, a starting point is to assess the capabilities and needs of developing countries. There's a number of metrics and indices out there to serve as proxies for the state of digital government in a number of countries. And while each of these measures is imperfect on its own, they do provide an informative look at kind of the status quo of where we're at right now to provide indicative um, indications of where donor support might be needed. So we start by looking at a series of five comprehensive composite indices of digital government readiness. The first two on this list are targeted specifically at core components of digital government readiness, while the other three cover a broader range of capabilities on which digital government is built. Um, these were chosen as indicative and because they had good development, developing country coverage. So our methodology for this um, exercise was to divide the countries on each index into four categories of e-government readiness. Low, which we code as red, basic, which we code as yellow, intermediate, which we code as blue, and advanced as green. And we calculate these categories separately for each, each index based on the mean and standard deviation of the data um, to allow the average country in each index to determine our category breaks. So looking at the composite indices, we find that they are largely consistent with each other. Um, countries tend to score in the same readiness category across all five of these. We find that scores are largely correlated with income level with low income countries scoring low in digital readiness, lower middle income countries scoring basic, upper middle income countries scoring intermediate, and high income countries scoring advanced. There is some more variation along regional lines, but unsurprisingly, North America and high income European countries score advanced. Developing countries in Europe and Central Asia and the Middle East are intermediate. East Asia and Latin America are intermediate on half and basic on half. And South Asia and Sub Saharan Africa bring out the bottom end of our spectrum. So, given the high degree of consistency across these composite industries, 
we move towards looking at country achievement on the six components that George outlined um, earlier. We try to find proxy measures to measure these six components. And while imperfect proxies, um, they give us at least an indication of where countries are at on these six foundational elements. So for digital infrastructure, we rely on a telecommunications infrastructure sub-index on the UN government. Digital literacy, we're looking at a human capital sub-index. For digital data, we look at online services. For digital participation, we look at an e-participation measure. And for government effectiveness, we use World Bank World Government indicators. Um, and for digital security, we use a cybersecurity index. We use these index names moving forward just to not um, uh, uh, say that the uh, indices are measuring something other than they're not, but we use these as proxies for kind of these six categories. So we again find that digital government is largely correlated with income level across these subcomponents. Low income countries score low readiness with the exception of cybersecurity. Lower middle income countries score basic on all indicators. Upper middle income countries rank intermediate, but there's still work to do on government effectiveness and cybersecurity. And interestingly, high income countries rank advanced on two categories and intermediate on four. So this reinforces our findings from the earlier half um, that digital government readiness largely tracks with GDP, but there is work that countries at all income levels can do to improve digital effectiveness. Um, there's a lot greater diversity of performance across regions given varying income levels. Um, we find that Sub-Saharan Africa still ranks slowly on all fronts. Um, East Asia and the Pacific and Middle East and South Asia are largely in the basic readiness categories on these various indices. And Latin America is split between um, intermediate and basic. So we dive a little bit into these trends by income group and region to see what this tells us about where donors might um, focus their efforts in digital government. We find looking, the first figure on this slide shows the relative position of various income groups across five of the six measures of digital governments. And we visualize government effectiveness separately since it's on a different um, scale. We look at implications for donor support for digital government on three different levels. We, there's a first level of foundational uh, development that is needed for any, for any development effort, including digital government. And so we find that low and middle income countries score low and need support on human capital development. This is important for both social and economic development in general and is crucial for digital readiness. We also find that all developing countries struggle with government effectiveness and thus are going to need large scale institution and capacity building support, both for agencies focused on digital readiness and beyond. Then we look at the core components of digital government, which relies on a strong infrastructure. And we find that low and middle income countries lack telecommunications infrastructure. Um, though many countries are bypassing traditional fixed broadband and landlines for mobile data subscriptions. And so we need concerted efforts here to address this digital divide. And finally, we look at technical capacity building to help governments actually run and monitor these online services. And we find that all developing countries are lagging in cybersecurity. As digital infrastructure and online systems are built out, there's a strong need to do so in ways that protect individual privacy and data security while protecting human rights. High income countries are the leaders in this area and thus can provide technical know-how and lessons learned to developing countries to build in these protections from the start. We also find that low income and lower middle income countries likewise need technical support to build out these online services that bring government closer to its citizens. Looking by region, we unsurprisingly find that Europe and North America are high performers and Africa and South Asia are lagging. So we find that both South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa first need support on human capital development in order to build skill sets necessary to engage with the digital world. And we also find that all developing regions except each Asia really need support on digital on government effectiveness. In terms of infrastructure, we find that all developing regions lag with particular support needed in South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, largely along the lines of the digital moonshot for Africa that the World Bank and others have spelled out. Many of these countries are leapfrogging analog technology and moving straight to these mobile phone based platforms, which, which could help streamline infrastructure needs if these are done in a regionally coordinated manner. 
And on technical capacity building, we find that most regions need support on online service provision. And most regions also need support on cybersecurity. Um, there's a re role for regional leaders here to help support their regional peers in building out these platforms that protect citizen privacy. And we also find that Latin America and the Middle East need support on e-participation, which could be integrated into larger governance and civil society strengthening programs. We also take a look at change over time, and this provides us with kind of a hopeful picture of digital government moving forward. The UN Digital Government um, Index has been tracked since 2003, and there's been vast improvements over the last 20 years, with the average score almost doubling over this period. There were the largest gains on telecommunications infrastructure and e-participation, and we see steady progress at all income levels. Um, and even low-income countries tripled their score, though this wasn't enough to close the gap with um, higher income levels. Regionally, all, all uh, regions gain as well, with the greatest catch-up by developing Europe and Central Asia, but still substantial gains from South Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa. And so based on these findings, we have a number of recommendations for how donors can better target assistance. So with that, I'll turn it back over to George. Thanks, Megan. Um, I'm going to hit on just a few findings and recommendations and leave you with a couple of questions that the study left us with. <coughs> One is the approach to digital government must be comprehensive. It must encompass all of those six areas of digital government and the, the path is not going to be linear. And as I emphasized earlier, and I can't emphasize enough, Digital government is much more than just about the technology. It's about the regular historic analog aspects of government that have to be improved and brought along. Secondly, donors need to avoid siloed solutions. For the most part, donors that are involved in, in the digital area tend to be involved in providing solutions for a particular intervention. Um, and they tend to create uh, digital solutions that are not interoperable and can't talk to each other. Um, and that's where the concept of global digital goods come in because global digital goods can provide a common flat pat platform on which all donors can operate. Secondly, donor collaboration is very important, but very difficult. Uh, there needs to be coordination and collaboration around a country's development strategy and its priorities. And this is much easier said than done. One, because donors have divergent interests. And two, because of the complexity of donor bureaucratic processes and requirements, especially the United States. Digital public goods is one of the values of deploying them is that they provide, as I said, this common platform on which all donors can build their digital interventions and it can make them inter interoperable. Um, and, and for the most part, these are open source so anybody can function with them. Now, I invite your thought on two areas that are in need of innovation. One is a need for principles for good development good digital development. There are technical guidelines that provide the technical aspects of how you build sustainable digital solutions. What is lacking is a set of ethical principles to keep donors away from support for digital government capabilities that could be used for autocratic and abusive purposes. And secondly, I think there need to be firewalls in all governments to protect digital capabilities from misuse. Think about in this country, the protections that we have for government capabilities that can be abused and weaponized. Our defense capabilities, our justice and police capabilities, the Federal Reserve, the SEC, and a myriad other of independent agency. They all come under civilian political control. 
but there are protections against that political control being misused. The protections aren't perfect, as we've seen the last year or so, but they have for the most part protected our government capabilities from being misused. And I'll end this presentation with the thought that we lack such guardrails in the area of the digital capacity of governments. We lack it in this country, we lack it in developing countries. It's actually difficult for me to envisage how, what those protections might entail for the United States. When you think about every government agency and department has their own digital systems and capabilities. Each of the 50 states have their own digital capabilities, thousands of local governments. And secondly, we are in a highly partisan era where it's very difficult to come to agreement on much. So how we build protections, firewalls against the misuse of digital capabilities is something that I think the, uh, the brains around Harvard need to be devoted to. Miriam, that is our presentation. Thank you all. Thank you guys so much, Megan and George. That was incredibly insightful presentation on digital government and its um, implementation and limitations um, in the United States and across the world. Um, so now we're going to open up uh, for Q&A and everyone can feel free to add um, your questions to the chat um, or you can use the raise hand function on Zoom. Um, but to start us off, I actually have a question for you guys. Um, throughout the presentation, um, you know, the risks of uh, digital government and the limitations of, you know, further developing digital government, especially in low income countries, um, was addressed. Um, so I guess my question is, if digital government continues to, you know, develop in um, high income countries and still lags behind um, in low and middle income countries, considering like the risks and limitations, um, how will that exacerbate like global inequality? Like what impact will that have? Well, if the lag continues, it definitely will aggravate global inequalities. Um, fortunately, we have seen <clears throat> some countries that not only have <clears throat> bridged that divide, but actually have gone beyond developed countries. India has a digital ID system. Um, that uh, I'm frustrated at ever thinking that we could have a digital ID system in the United States. Um, several of the countries when COVID hit, uh, specifically Sri Lanka and Togo, they had existing digital platforms. And in the case of Sri Lanka, within two days, they were able to adapt that system to be able to register and track incoming travelers. Togo took 10 days to modify their existing ID platform in order to provide monthly stipends um, to, to poor populations. So the, the digital divide is continuing it has not been reduced much in the last 10 years, but there are isolated instances. And I think COVID, if anything, has put digital capacity on the agenda of donors and on the agenda of developing countries. And I think there are few countries that don't understand the need to reduce that divide. So I'm, in the, I'm the optimist that says in 10 or 15 years, you're gonna see a considerable collapsing of that digital divide. Megan? You're here. 
<laughs> no, I think I think also the the leapfrogging of low and low and middle income countries over some of these analog technologies, you know, they're going straight to mobile money instead of to credit cards. We're going straight to data plans on your smartphone instead of having a wired dial up connection like I had when I was a kid. So I do think, you know, these gaps are persistent and are going to take concerted efforts. But I do think the pace of digital adaptation also has the ability to let some of these lower income countries leapfrog and do some of that catch up growth um, if we're intentional about our development programs. Thank you guys so much. Um, and our next question is from Key. Um, if you want to ask your question aloud. Hello. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kay, a first year Kennedy School student studying in international development. And before graduate school, I worked at the Japanese government. So thank you very much for the presentation, which is so helpful. So I have two questions. So first one is, as you mentioned, as only 20% of digital government projects succeed, so could you elaborate on the possible reasons for their success and failures? Uh, the other question is, uh, as you just mentioned, the case of Sri Lanka and Togo. So are there any other countries you are particularly paying attention to now in terms of digital government in low income countries and lower middle income countries context? Thank you so much. And I apologize, but you talked about 20%, but I forgot what you connected the 20% to. So repeat your first question, please. I think, George, it was what leads to the success and failure. Are there any, do we know why some succeed and some fail, or is that just part of the larger digital innovation process? Yes, that's right. Uh, okay. Oh, yes. All right. That's <clears throat> the answer is um, the most, con from the analysis I've seen, the, the failure is based principally on the failure to plan properly. The plan to understand the plan, the failure to analyze the ecosystem in which you're trying to introduce digital capabilities, and the failure to plan ahead <clears throat> for each one of those steps. <clears throat> and secondly, the failure to have a constant feedback loop. You know almost by definition that what you plan today is not going to be, is not going to play out exactly as you intend a week from now or three months from now. So you've got to have a continuous feedback loop and have the flexibility to continue to adjust your solutions so that they they keep up with the with 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 the learning that you go along with. It's that learning along the process that's so critical. Um, and the third reason is people lose focus. They, uh, the political system uh, goes on to other issues. After three or four years, suddenly digital isn't the uh, flavor of the day and it no, no longer gets the leadership and the support that it needs. And <clears throat> the answer is um, there, I, I'm sure that there are other countries out there that are having the innovations of Sri Lanka and Togo um, and it seems like every month um, I pick up something and read of another country that's done something that I haven't heard of. A lot of developing countries are taking advantage of like mobile money and digital platforms for social safety nets that they can make direct cash transfers to their citizens. And I think you've seen a proliferation of direct cash transfers. I think there was something like 30 countries were using direct cash transfers before COVID and like 190 are now. The World Bank is doing an ongoing study that continually updates that number. So I think there's there's been a lot of innovation. Um, and so I think that's that's a sign for hope in you know what is a sticky situation that you need a lot of government actors to act with one voice on. And that, that innovation has particularly been prevalent in the areas of health and agriculture and digital capabilities and small farmers with their smartphones suddenly have real-time data 
on market conditions that influence them as to when they should sell, what they should plant. Um, it connects them to the market. Uh, it provides them in some cases with credit, with micro insurance and reduces the transaction cost. So you're seeing a lot of innovation at a very micro level that is helping uh, small farmers around the world. Thank you guys. Our next question is from Jeremy and what role does leadership play into this discussion where uh, some government administrators are open to digital technology while others still live in the past? Um, I think you've answered your question. Um, and, and the development of a digital system is a top-down, bottom-up process. Um, but it takes that constant leadership at the top to keep the process going, but the process has to be informed from the demands and needs from citizens that are coming from the various communities. But without the leadership, uh, you're not gonna have the planning, you're not gonna have the resources, and you're not gonna have the courage to take the risk that, that comes along um, with developing digital government. <clears throat> I think the challenge with leadership is like digital government investments are like a 10 to 20 year time horizon, which is well beyond the political time horizon of most politicians who are looking to get elected every two, four, six, eight years. And so it really needs champion leadership from the top, but how to sustain that over changing administrations, I think has been a really ch real challenge for many countries. Thank you, guys. Um, and our next question um, is from Tahani. Um, if you would like to unmute yourself and ask it aloud. Yeah, sure. Uh, is my voice clear? Yeah, okay. So, so thank you so much for the informative presentation. I found the point you mentioned about um, uh, this balancing the center ownership and decentralized implementation in the context of developing countries is very interesting, uh, especially given the capacity of local government in many developing countries. So I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the kind of like the trade offs faced by each choice or while trying to balance that. Uh... Yeah, I'll make, I'll make two points on that. And that is, as I said, you need, <clears throat> you need some basic centralized platforms, but the, the lesson that's been learned over 15 years is is those platforms are then utilized <clears throat> or decentralized into individual government agencies and services and local government. Um, one, because you don't want one centralized database that is subject to failure and being um, bro broken into. You want those databases developed individual and linked together and secondly, one of the real complexities that you actually is, I think, somewhat behind your question is while you need this decentralized system, uh, too often local government doesn't have the resources, doesn't have the financial and human resources to, to implement the digital government. So while you're developing the capacity at the central government, you've got to make sure that you're developing the capacity at the local level too. Okay. Um, if there are no other questions or comments, um, thank you, Megan and George for such a great discussion. Um, and to our audience today for coming. I'd again like to remind everyone that our next speaker series is on Friday, February 11th at our normal time of 12 p.m. Eastern with Jacqueline Klopp, the co-director of the Center for Sustainable Urban Development and a research scholar at Columbia University uh, who will discuss climate change, digital data commons and the politics of urban transport in African cities. We hope you'll join us. Thanks again and have a great day.